Today I'm going to show you what's inside of a Nissan continuously variable transmission and why they fail. Here we've got a CVT from a 2012 Nissan Altima. Now it was slipping and it was having trouble accelerating. Taking a look around here we've got the variators which sit inside of this area over here. At the top we have the park neutral switch which tells the computer what gear you're selected. At the back here we have the final drive where the axles would plug into. Now around the front side here we have the hookups for the oil pump and the torque converter. Here's the final drive speed sensor. And at the front here we have a starter that would sit here we have a dipstick tube as well as the transmission cooler hookup line and the other speed sensor over here now it's no secret that Nissan transmissions have a very high failure rate so I'm gonna go ahead and start disassembling this transmission by removing these bell housing bolts now these should all be 14s yeah there's transmission fluid leaking everywhere all right this time I got a piece of my brother's old shirt here some dress pants and another dress shirt now dress clothes are not really the best for soaking up fluids because they're not very absorbent but I'll just use what we have a couple more bolts across the bottom here there's two here that require the ratcheting wrench. Here I'm going to remove the final drive speed sensor. It's got a circuit board on it, that's cool. And I went to this place in America called Harbor Freight. They got some pretty cheap tools, so let's see how this works. There we go. Working backwards, you can see we've got the final drive here where the axles would plug into. This is an open differential. If you want to learn more about how open differentials work, I do have a video linked above. Over here we have a gear reduction, which you can see here. That is driven by the secondary variator. The variators live in the back here, which has the whole belt system. And the input shaft is what's coming from the engine over here through the torque converter. Now, interestingly, we have this chain over here, which is what drives the oil pump located down inside of here. This chain should be driven by these little prongs over here that connect to the torque converter. Now let's just move these differential and this gear reductor out of the way. There's a lot of buildup of some kind of metallic substance on this plate over here. So let's remove this plate. My bet is something has failed, like a clutch, and that's where the material is coming off. I'm going to take this plate off over here. It's a bunch of 12s. I'm going to go ahead and remove all these pan bolts. All right, let's see how much fluid is inside this transmission. Oh, that's not a lot. Check out all these little furry bits on the magnet. There's something wearing down inside of this transmission that is catching on these magnets. I mean, it's a good thing you have the magnets, but it's also a bad thing to see so much deposit captured on them. All right, next up, I'm going to remove the filter. It's hard to see, but this filter looks like it's got some particles inside of there. And check out all of the particles stuck to the actual body. Check out the iron particles that are stuck to these bolts. All right, next up, I'm going to remove the valve body. I'm going to remove the nut for the manual valve. All right, now I'm going to remove the valve body. There we go. There's the valve body. Get this connector bob off here. We'll take a look at this in a bit. All right, let's see if I can remove this dipstick. There's actually a dipstick in this one. Some CVTs don't have a dipstick. It's just a tube with a cover on it. I'm going to remove this coolant union. This is where transmission fluid exits out and goes to the cooler. And then this is the return. Just pop this off. There's a filter inside of here. That's a good idea. An externally accessible filter that you can change. However, there's still that internal one. It doesn't look like this one captured as much particles as the magnets in the pan though. Now, when you're doing your diagnostics, you see you've got these holes here where the valve body are going to feed fluid into the clutches and the variators. There's four bolts over here where you can actually connect gauges to make sure those pressures are going good. Part of your diagnostic before tearing this thing down and condemning it. I'm going to remove the parking pole detent. This is the mechanism that gives you that satisfying click when you shift gears all right now I'm going to flip this over so we can get to the variator side of this transmission now the back here we've got another cover you can see these are the oil passages that are casted inside of this piece here which allow oil to flow to those variators to change the gear ratio better remove all these bolts going around now for each variator there's three 12 millimeter bolts that hold it to this casing over here and over here now it's time to find out how many bolts you've missed yeah, I don't think this is meant to be. Alright, now we got the real hammer, the old school one. So I think I have to remove this gear in order to get the variators out from the bottom. Don't you hate it when you got a brand new socket set and you still don't have the right set? That's probably a 40 or 41 mil because 39 does not fit. Alright, so this whole CVT mechanism just fell out because this little piston over here was hanging up inside of here. So here we've got the mechanism. Let's take a closer look. So let's take a look at how the continuously variable transmission mechanism works. Here we have the two variators and it's got these cone shapes on the inside here where we have the CVT belt riding up against it. Now on this side here the variator is actually spread the furthest apart here which is going to allow the belt to ride on the smallest radius. 
And on this side here, it's the closest together, which means that the belt will ride on its largest radius over here. Now this one here is the driving variator, which takes its power ultimately from the engine. And this one here is the driven side that goes to the final drive. Now in the current setup, we have a very small radius on this side and a very large radius on this side. So this will give you a torque multiplication. So as you can see, as the engine is spinning very, very fast, the driven side spins very, very slow. And you would use this when you're taking off from a stop in like a first gear type of scenario. So the parking ball mechanism has this cone over here, which is going to press down on the parking ball mechanism over here. Now, once that engages, it's going to engage and lock the secondary variator over here. And that little tab is all that's preventing your vehicle from rolling away. So make sure you use your parking brake. Now in order to change the drive ratio you have to vary this distance by pushing these cones closer to each other on this side and spreading them out further over on this side here. Now to do that it's all about pressure. So the valve body would put some pressure into this variator over here and as you squeeze this over here it's going to force the belt to move out. At the same time you have to relax the pressure inside of this one so it allows it to kind of spread open this way so that the belt rides on a shorter radius. If you have a larger radius on this side and then a shorter radius on the final drive that's how you're going to have a speed increase and that would be helpful in an overdrive scenario like if you're going down the highway now everything here is about pressure you see if anything is leaking such as one of the seals in the variator well you're going to lose pressure and when you don't have that much pressure squishing against this belt it's going to start to slip now this belt here relies on that pressure inside of these variators to grip onto the side of it and push this is a push style belt not a pull style belt like in your alternator now lubrication and cooling is also very important if you have degradation of fluid inside of here well you're not going to hold its fluid strength along these surfaces over here and that's also going to cause either slippage or excessive wear on these cones. I'm going to knock this piece out here and this is the transmission casing. You can see this is the oil fill for the secondary variator and that's the parking paw mechanism with the tooth. So here we are at the back you can see we've got the bracket that bolts it onto the case. We have these bearings at the end here and a giant 50 something millimeter socket. I'm going to use my 50 something millimeter socket to remove these nuts. Oh yeah, there you go, I busted a nut. All right, let's see if this puller is going to work to remove the bearing. All right, so here's how the variator part works. You've got this piece here, which is basically fixed. It takes the input torque from the planetary gear set and is always rotating. Then we have this other side over here. Now this one actually slides up and down on this shaft back and forth, and that's what's gonna control the drive ratio. Now as this thing slides up and down, sitting behind it is this piston. Now this piston goes inside here and seals nice and well against transmission fluid. Now because this needs to hold the rotational torque, there's actually three keyways over here that are machined inside of this variator housing as well as on this side variator shaft over here and in order to hold them together and I'm assuming these little balls or debris that fell out while I was pressing this out were what's wedged inside of this little keyway here to clock this when it's set to prevent it from spinning. Now if you look really closely inside of there likewise there's a lot of wear marks over here especially in the turning direction on the keyways of the shaft. Check that out, all that damage over there. You can assume that this thing was probably wiggling around over there as those pegs wore out. And over time with vibration and forward and reverse direction, those pegs would have probably sheared off, allowing the variators to slip. And of course, once the variator loses its clocking, so will the pressure on the belt and that'll slip as well. Next up, we've got the piston that's supposed to seal the fluid inside of here and create good pressure. When I pulled it out, I saw that the piston ring here was actually damaged. This is a seal. There was another section over here where it was a little dented in. You can see this thing's just coming all apart here and it's just so brittle. Now if your seal is not holding that pressure, obviously your fluid is gonna start to drain back and leak out and you can't hold that pressure against the belt and it's gonna slip. Next up, we look at the CVT belt. Now this has to transmit all the torque from the engine to the wheels. This is a push style steel belt where it's gonna grab on over here and actually push in order to transmit torque. And this belt is interesting because it's got two steel bands on the outside and hundreds of these little key pieces over here. Now they're shaped like this so that the angle of them here matches the V of the angle of the cone and they just squish together and that's how they're held together. If I take this steel band out this way, this entire thing is gonna disintegrate into hundreds of pieces all over. Now CVT belt belt failure is actually a pretty common failure because again this is just a flexible piece of metal after some fatigue wear or you don't change your transmission fluid and it burns this thing's going to start to wear on the outside 
or the whole entire belt could snap. Now the secondary variator varies because you've actually got a giant spring inside of here that's forcing this one closed and that's good because in fail safe mode for example you lose hydraulic pressure or the vehicle is off there's no hydraulic pressure going into the first one and there's spring pressure against the second one and that's going to give you a fail safe of a first gear type of drive ratio so at least the vehicle can move around a bit. Right, let's see if I can chop this nut off. Right, let's pop this off. Got another busted nut there. All right, so I was able to beat the bearing off of there. Now I can remove the bracket. And I wonder if this variator also comes off. I was trying to get this off with the three jaw, but no luck, it's too tight. All right, I'm gonna see if I can remove this nut. It's a 40 something mil. Easy clap. Look at the section view of that nut. Looks pretty cool, but it feels hot though. All right, we've got the three jaw on there. Let's take this off. All right, so I removed the snap ring. All right, knock the cover free there. I'm gonna pull off this dust cover here. Ooh, I was wondering if I was gonna get shot. Alrighty. I'm supposed to use spring compressors for this. That's the piston. And it's got a seal around there. The seal looks like it's intact. No nicks like the other one. Here we have this giant spring. That provides a preload when the transmission has no pressure. And inside of here we have the piston. I'm gonna go empty this. I'm gonna pop off this inside piece, the variator. I expect the little balls that are inside of here are going to fall out. Oh wow, there's so many of these little balls. So these little balls are what sit inside of these grooves over here and allow this to maintain its clocking so the torque can be transmitted properly. All right, so unlike the other side, the grooves inside of the variator housing over here and over here on the shaft look pretty much brand new. There's no wear that you could see. So how this part works is we've got this piston and this is going to fill with hydraulic fluid through these holes over here which correlate to the holes on the shaft. Now we've got a seal on the outside here, in this case it's in good condition, but interestingly there's no seal on the inside here where it reaches the shaft. Now this is going to be set on top of there and we have the spring here as a preload that's always pushing up against the belt. Alright, so let's get to removing the rest of this transmission. Apparently there's a snap ring inside of here that needs to be widened and then I should be able to remove this gear. It's literally just a wire you got to pull out. There we go. That's pretty dumb. It's bearing up. And there's the gear and the tiny chain and the drive gear that locks into the torque converter and the spacer. And I can remove this dust shield. This thing's got a lot of debris on it. Got six mil hex holding the boil pump on. I'm crying for my life and didn't realize it. Now I can remove the pump. The pump is basically like the heart of the transmission because you need fluid pressure in order to make the transmission work properly. If there's a problem with this pump, it's got a cloggage somewhere in the system. Or if it's just not pumping properly, the veins are worn out, that could also cause your transmission to fail. Now in order to make the CVT spin backwards and forwards, there is a clutch system inside of here with a planetary gear set. Oh, it doesn't look that smoke to me. So we got one set of clutches inside of here and that's controlled through this input shaft. And then there's another set of clutches that sits inside of here. And then this set of clutches can come out. These clutches look like they're in pretty decent shape actually. And then there's this return spring. And then there's this return spring. Then we have the piston, and you'd probably use compressed air to pop this out, but I don't have that. It's got two vice grips on here. All right, we got it here. That's the piston, and it looks like the seals are in good shape, but if these seals weren't working, we wouldn't be able to hold that planetary gear set in order to transmit torque to the rest of the system. Now, the rest of the casing basically holds everything together, but it's also a hydraulic pathway for all of the things that it needs to control. So, for example, filter sits inside of here. It's got to take fluid out to the radiator and then back in here. We've got all of these little passages here that are going to control the clutches inside of here. Here. The oil pump that sits inside of here also pumps fluid over to the other side where the variators are going to hook up to. Your variators are going to sit inside of here and receive hydraulic pressure through the case top. And controlling all of that is where the valve body would sit through all of these holes here where it's going to send oil pressure to the correct clutches and variators in order to control the transmission. Let's take a look at how this planetary gear set works here. We've got the input coming from this side and that spins the ring gear of the planetary gear set. And inside of there there's a clutch set that's going to line up with the sun gear over here. Now the sun gear is actually the output that goes to the rest of the transmission. If you lock up that clutch, your sun gear and the ring gear is going to spin at the same speed and this whole thing is going to rotate at the engine's RPM. Now if you want to change directions, just lock the planet carrier, 
to the casing of the transmission using this clutch over here and then that's going to give you a reverse direction taking a look at the condition of this clutch here you can see it's actually in pretty good shape they're still kind of brown this car only had 165,000 kilometers on it by the way and nothing is really burnt up or smelling bad I do notice that there's a lot of free play and a lot of noise coming from this planet carrier so I wonder if the gears or the bearing inside of there are worn out it sounds really loud so I moved the snap ring and got this clutch set out now we're going to take a closer look at the condition of it let's pop off the snap ring this is the ring gear you can see this is splined to this outside piece over here take out the clutch set wait is there a snap ring there's another snap ring there's another snap ring how many snap rings you got There's the clutch set and there's a piston inside of here. Now this piston is fed by these little holes inside of here. Now looking at this clutch set, oh boy. Some of them have a little bit of burn marks on the top over here. And these are a little bit darker than I would like them to be. However, they're not completely smoked. But I can definitely tell this transmission is probably slipping. You can see the friction area here is a lot darker than where the teeth are. And you can see all the wear marks on the steel bands over here. And why would it be slipping? Well the answer is always pressure and fluid. If you don't change your fluid, it's going to lose the proper viscosity that you need. It's going to start to suspend a lot of particles in there and clog up arteries, which again are going to reduce the pressure. And just pop off the sun gear over here. This is a giant sun gear that spins inside of these planets. And of course, the advantage to a CVT is that the belt does not have as much friction as a clutch set like this in an automatic transmission. In a regular automatic, you'd have about four or five of these clutch packs, whereas in this one, you just have these two. And clutches, when they're not applied, do create a bit of drag, so you can see how this design is a lot more efficient. Now if the pump is the heart, the valve body is the brains of the transmission. You can see this here is basically a giant control where we have our four solenoids over here, a pressure control switch. Now essentially how this works is you've got pressure coming in from the oil pump and these solenoids are going to redirect that to either lock up or unlock clutches and variators in order to control the transmission properly. I'm going to remove the servo motor over here. You can see the little servo motor. Now the purpose of the servo motor is to adjust the amount of fluid pressure going to the variator. It can move in and out and it's connected to this T-joint over here, which also has this piece attached to it, which actually rides up against the variator itself. And that's going to sense the position in and out of where the variator is. And then in between here we have this hydraulic valve, which has three main modes, apply, release, or hold that fluid pressure. So essentially this acts like a closed loop control circuit where you know where your variator are and you can control the amount of hydraulic fluid going through it to this valve. I'm just gonna knock off one of these solenoids here so we can see what it looks like basically you're going to redirect flow inside of that valve body. It's actually a little computer chip inside of here and if you're swapping valve bodies or transmissions make sure you keep your original so you don't have to reprogram this. Inside the valve body itself if we open it up it's like a maze inside of here and this is where the valves inside of here can redirect that fluid to the appropriate spot but these metal shims inside of here as well. Of course these are like little arteries so if they do get clogged or a valve starts to stick that's also when you're going to notice imminent signs of transmission failure. That's why it's really important to change your fluid because not only does it prevent wear on wear items like gears and clutches but it's also important to form these hydraulic circuits. Now the main problem with most of these Nissans is that the design here is really undersized as well as the cooling system and a lot of people don't maintain their Nissans, typical Nissan owners. Some of them don't even come with a filter or external cooling lines. My recommendation would be make sure you add a cooling system especially if you're doing heavier duties like taking the kids to soccer practice or something. Now with most CVTs you really don't want to be doing any towing or anything heavy duty because after after all CVTs are meant for very light duty and to save a lot of fuel not to haul around a lot of stuff. Let's take a look at the oil pump real quick. See if this comes apart. You can see this is a vein style oil pump. So you've got these little veins that are going to rotate and that's what's going to create fluid flow inside of this eccentric hole. Now this one does not look like it's worn out too much, like too much debris was passed through it. There's a bit of wear on the housing over here, but the veins themselves all look intact. And that's pretty much a look inside of a failed Nissan CVT. There's a lot of failure mechanisms inside of here. A lot of it has to do with the fluid. you got to make sure that you change your fluid if you don't want this to happen to you and make sure it's cooled properly and you don't abuse the vehicle. There's a lot of failure. Now there is a lot of failure mechanisms inside of here from the variators themselves failing, the belt snapping, the clutches failing, the valve body getting clogged up, or any other part that moves inside of here can fail, just like any other automatic transmissions. It's just unfortunate that Nissan had to go through a huge lawsuit in order to solve the problem, even though their late model cars are still failing. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.